Okay, let's admit everybody. Bit by bit, hopefully everyone is coming in. Sorry all that I'm a minute late. I seem to have started two meetings at the same time and was waiting on my own in another meeting. So hopefully everyone's coming in this one. Do we have Ricky, Ophia and James? Yes, we do. Hey everyone, how are you? Hi. Good, it's very early. It is early, it is early. Although technically it's 11 a.m. So kind of gain an hour. How was that? Did everyone um, remember to do the clocks? I did mine before I went to bed. I was very organized. Super smart, super smart. I always freak out about it. I'm always like, oh God, not that there's anything ever really to really be freaked out about on a Sunday, although obviously event, but I feel like with phones and stuff, because it does it all automatically for you, I don't get that stressed out about it. It's only when I like come into the kitchen or somewhere else and I see another clock and I'm like, fuck, which is the correct time? Like, I don't understand which one it is, but luckily we're fine. How are you, James? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. How are you? Good, yeah, I'm good, thank you. And Ricky, you're good? I'm good, I've been up since like 6.30, so I've been chilling. <laughs> Love that oh, by choice or by just waking up naturally? Naturally and choice. Like, like I told myself yesterday, I want to get up early, go for a walk, and it just happens. So I was like, I'll roll with that, to be honest. Love that. That's so <laughs> good. I feel like that's such a nice, liberating thing when you set that like mantra to yourself the night before and it actually happens. So many times right. you're like, I'll go for a run, I'll go for a little exercise, and your alarm goes off or whatever. And you're like, absolutely. Hell no. I'll do right. that. Don't worry. <laughs> Gosh, I'm so impressed. Well done. Well, thank you guys. I think let's get kicking off. There's a couple of people who keep um, joining, but we'll let people come and go. And obviously this is recorded, so it will go on YouTube afterwards if that is fine with everyone. If not, shout and I can somehow blur out your face or blur out your voice. I don't know how, but maybe we can make that work. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. If you haven't been to one before, uh, this is a series called Stomach Stories, which I do. Mm like every month but it's been a little while since we've done one before um we get some guest speakers on so today we've got Afia, we've got ricky and we've got james who are all amazing within the ibd community all have their own stories they have their own instagram pages um but i will let each of them introduce themselves each one will talk for a little bit 10 minutes 15 minutes however long you want to talk for the floor is yours about whatever you'd like to discuss and then at the end we're going to do a bit of a Q&A so I'd love to do that at the end because we've already had some messages come through on Instagram and for anybody who's in this chat if someone says something that you think is fascinating or you've got more questions pop them in the little chat box on Zoom it's like at the bottom of your screen so you'll see it um, and we will answer all the questions at the end so that's amazing if you are not a speaker if you could have your uh microphone off that would be amazing it's just so that um the camera picks up who is talking at the right time and when it goes onto youtube it obviously makes it a much better experience so if you see me try and mute you uh apologies i'm just trying to turn you off so without further ado i don't know who wants to kick off does anybody want to volunteer Oh, God, no. I don't mind. <laughs> Ricky, do it. Please do it, because otherwise it's so awkward if I'm like, <laughs> Everyone's just staring there, staring at each other. <laughs> Please go for it, Ricky. Introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Ricky. I run a platform called Wellness with Ricks, where I talk about um, my journey with inflammatory bowel disease and endometriosis, and a bit about holistic wellness and lifestyle. Um... Okay, do you want me to do the 10 minutes? Amazing. Now? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, if you sure. take the so floor down, all yours, go, why not? <laughs> right. So my journey has been a bit unconventional in the sense that um, I think it started off the conventional way. It took, I know from speaking to a lot of people within the community um, that a lot of people, it took them a while to get their diagnosis. Um, so for me, it started off, um, I think around 2010, I was just like, really really tired like dark circles under my eyes like a lot of back pain stomach pain and it's like I was back and forth getting blood tests and back and forth with the hospital like monthly and it's like they couldn't figure out anything was wrong they're like oh she's just growing like it'll be fine and I was like but this this isn't normal like I, I'm not fine and then I go back and it was just quite a dismissive approach but then I had a really really nice consultant and he was like okay I know 
they keep trying to dismiss everything, but I feel like there's something wrong here and I really want to help you find your diagnosis. And I was just like, thank you. <laughs> but anyway, um, two years later, they gave me a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. And that's like, as I'm sure to most of you guys, <laughs> it's a shock to the system when you kind of get diagnosed with an autoimmune condition and someone's just, you go from thinking that, okay, something is just a bit off to you're going to have this for life. It's a bit like, how do I even begin to process that? How do I even feel like, what do I even do? Can I change anything? And so, sometimes I think for me, like I kind of started to blame myself. I was like, oh, maybe, maybe it's my fault that this happened. Like maybe I could have done something to prevent it. And oh, I hope like it doesn't affect like my kids when they're younger and like all of these crazy things are just going through your head. And it's, it's an intense period. And it's like people who haven't been through it can't really understand it the same way, especially in the beginning, you know? And, um, you yeah, know, that was hard. And it's like, some of my friends didn't get it. So it kind of just made it feel harder because I just felt like I was this weirdo. So it's like, honestly, I didn't really tell many people about it because I was kind of just like, okay, I don't want to be like, especially when you're in school, people can be a bit mean, you know? It can go two ways. Either people will like really accept you or well, they really don't. And I was like, I'm not trying to test the waters with that one. I'm gonna just keep myself to myself. <laughs> I'm just gonna push through and act like everything's okay. And you know, I feel like I'm glad I did that, but I also wish I had more courage to be a bit more open because you never know, there could have been someone else going through a similar thing. And maybe by me being more open, it would have given them the courage to realize that they're not alone or to speak up about it. But at the same time, I didn't want to take that risk. I'm gonna be honest. So I did. <laughs> but, Hell yeah. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. So yeah, I started off um, taking medication and um, it was, that was an interesting journey. I did see some relief initially, but then my immunity just went downhill and I was very, very sick for a long period of time. And I was back and forth with the hospital again and they were just saying, oh, well, this is just how it's going to be. And it just felt like anytime I voiced a problem or a concern, it was treated as if I was being difficult or as if like, that's just how it is and there's nothing we can or will do about it. And I was kind of just, I just felt helpless and I felt like a victim to be honest. And I was kind of just like, okay, so what do I do then? Is, do I just have to accept that this is just my fate forever? I'm going to feel like shit, sorry, <laughs> for the rest of my life. Like I, I don't understand. And it just got to a point where, um, I think it was around like winter time one year, I was really, really ill to the point where I was like bedridden for about a month. Like I was so sick. Like I couldn't even stand without feeling like I was gonna pass out. And I knew it's because I was ill, but then also being on immunosuppressants further dampened your immune system. So I wasn't really getting better either. And I was just there like stuck in this like limbo. And I was like, I'm gonna die. Like I genuinely felt so low and so horrible and I didn't know what to do. And I was just lying there. And I just said to myself, there has to be another way. Like. I don't believe that I was put on this earth to just feel this way forever. I was like, no way. And I didn't know what that other way was. I had no clue, but I was just like to myself, I will find it. I will commit myself to finding it. And um, over time, I just said to myself, I can't do this medication thing. It's just, I know there are a lot of benefits with it, but for me, I'd had no quality of life. Um, so I was like, okay, I came off medication. I, did have a lot of pushback from the doctors about that but that is what it is um, I did learn you're entitled to make your own decisions and never be afraid to speak up or ask something or say I don't agree like it's your body and it's your life you can do what you want but um, from then it was very a very slow process my immunity did start to build up I did try a lot of natural remedies and a lot of it was a lot of like trial and error and um, I did realize that healing is not linear. It's like, it's not like suddenly you just take this thing and you're good. No, <laughs> definitely, I wish, <laughs> definitely not. Like it's literally, it's a process. And I had to remind myself, I didn't get to this place and I didn't get this way overnight. So my body is not gonna get back to where it was or restore the quality of life overnight either. So there was a lot of trial and error. And um, I also learned not to just, do like not to just take advice from people on the internet <laughs> and I say that within reason because there's a lot of people who speak theory or speak things that they have may have seen but have you have an experience with a condition similar for one or are you qualified you know like where is your information coming from because there is a lot of valuable resources online don't get me wrong there's so much but there's a lot of people who are just speaking to speak you know and <laughs> 
And I literally went through a lot of that being like, oh, okay, I'm going to try this. Or, oh, just do yoga. It was to solve everything. I was like, okay. <laughs> at the end of the day, if you're not treating the root cause of the problem and, and like making sure your diet is right and everything, no amount of yoga is going to solve your life's problems. Yoga along with other things, for sure. But just doing one thing, no, I, I try. <laughs> Don't do it me. I tried so you guys don't have to, you know. Imagine you every day like yoga day 204. <laughs> really bloody sick. <laughs> no, honestly, like I was trying and I was like, I mean, I feel zen, but I still feel sick. So something's wrong here. I don't know. It's not been, it's, you know, it's been an interesting journey. I've learned a lot about myself and my body and natural healing methods and but it's been very up and down, you know, I realized one thing as well is taking care of your mental health is so important because dealing with a lot of chronic illnesses sometimes means that you're in pain frequently and dealing, being in pain frequently is physically draining, emotionally draining and mentally draining, especially it's like if you're working a nine to five or you're trying to support other people, it's like if you barely have energy for yourself, how do you have the energy for other people too, you know? And that can be that can be intense. So I've learned as well, for me, taking care of my mental health, whether that be like through doing things like that make me happy or like going, doing, being active, going for walks, doing yoga, <laughs> um, journaling or like speaking to people about it, people who create the space for you because at the end of the day, not everybody gets it and that's okay, you know? But it's good to know that even if you feel like you don't have anybody, you need to be able to be there for yourself, first and foremost, at the end of the day, because everybody has their own lives. And um, it's hard. I know sometimes it can be hard when you're going through it and you might need someone to support you, but everybody has their own lives. No one can be there for you 100% of the time. So learning to be there for myself and learning to be able to manage my emotions and take care of myself, I think definitely helped on the journey because on the, in those times where I did feel like I had no one, I could keep going you know, and I could keep trying and keep getting better. But I think for me, definitely what has changed and made my journey better was discovering functional medicine and nutrition because um, functional medicine takes into account the holistic approach. So not just diet, not just lifestyle, but everything, mental, physical, um, the nutrition side of things. And it was through that, it kind of started to bring my body into balance. It was like checking, okay, do I have nutritional deficiencies? Because if you're not fueling your body the right way, knowing that all your processes work together, if you're not kind of giving your body the right things for your body's processes to work, it's inevitable that you're going to have some type of issues. So kind of having diet for me as the foundation and then the lifestyle things on top of that created a better lifestyle for me. And I've been in remission for several years now. And it's like, if it wasn't for that, <laughs> thank you. if it wasn't for that, like, I don't know what I would have done if I'm honest. It was, oh my gosh, it's been like, I'm not saying anything's perfect. Being remission, being in remission doesn't always mean that you have completely like no symptoms. It just means that your disease is, um, it isn't currently active, you know, and you have a better quality of life. So I'm also trying not to be, get complacent at the end of the day, just because I feel better now, doesn't mean I'm going to be like, okay, so I'm going to do whatever I want and then end up back how I was. No, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So definitely the consistency is so key. It's not easy, but sometimes I think we just have to learn to accept that certain things will and won't work for us. There's no point kind of being like, oh, well, I'm going to do what I want and then be in pain the next day and then kind of feel helpless because you did something that put you in pain, you know? So I think, well, that's been a hard thing for me, just accepting, okay, maybe wheat isn't for me. Being in a country where like everything's made of wheat, you know, <laughs> like trying to eat out is it's not fun, but it's like, I've kind of just had to learn and accept certain things. And I mean, that is what it is. And it's part of the journey and just learning to work with your body rather than against it, definitely. But yeah, with all that being said, I'm definitely not like anti-medication or anything like that. I just had to do what worked for me in that moment. And if I do get to a point where I need it, I would definitely consider it. But I think it would be better this time knowing that I am doing other things to support myself because in the beginning, I didn't know anything about nutrition. I didn't know that there were alternatives. I didn't know that I could do anything to contribute to getting 
a better quality of life. And it's like, um, now that I found that, I can't unsee any of that, <laughs> you know? So I feel like it's my duty to take care of myself. And if I don't, then I'm only really playing myself at the end of the day. So yes, that's my story. <laughs> For sure, I think that's amazing. And like your journey is so incredible, but I think like something that you've touched on, which is so true. And I think probably something that everybody has seen is you never get told that stuff really when you've been diagnosed. And like you said, it's, it's something that you educate and teach yourself. And it's like you said, like a journey of discovery. And now that you've learned that, you can't unsee that, but in yeah. definitely not in my experience anyway, none of my hospital appointments when I was diagnosed was diet or lifestyle ever really spoken about or any type of holistic approach. It was always this is your condition. Yeah. Exactly. I don't think anyone is. And I would be amazed if someone has, but I feel like they're like, you're sick, here's the medication to to manage it. Like no matter what. It's like, here's the medicine, have more medicine, have more medicine, not have you thought about this? Have you right. learned about this? And then letting right. you maybe have that knowledge to make your own decisions. Because I think also, like you said, Ricky, people, um, especially in my experience as well, of when you want to come off those medications, I think you get a lot of pushback and there's not necessarily that conversation. It feels like that's this is the only way we can help you. The only way we can help right. you is if you take all these pills. And that isn't, you know, that doesn't make everyone feel comfortable. That doesn't necessarily work for everybody. And Sure. Yeah, I think it's really, really interesting for you to have touched on that because even like Ophelia saying like, oh yeah, I was the same. I, probably all of us have been in the same boat and feeling the same thing. So that's really, really interesting. I also have a ton of questions for you, Ricky, as well, but I'm <laughs> end because I don't want to run over. No Literally, I'm like writing notes like, okay, ask this, ask this. <laughs> move on. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. That was really amazing for you no to worries. share your story with us. And only because you're next on my screen, but Ophelia, would you like to speak next or do you want James to go next? I can go next, that's fine. Do it, go for it, girl. <laughs> so um, I'm quite new to this kind of Instagram illness community. I only really started my account, um, I think end of June, beginning of July, even though I've lived with chronic illness all of my life. Um, I was just kind of very closed off and didn't really want to talk about it. So I just kind of hid and was like, I don't want to talk about it. So I never did. Um, <laughs> but I guess I'll start kind of um, right at the beginning with my um, with my atopic um, triad. So if you've never heard of the atopic triad before, it's where you have a tendency to kind of have um, allergic conditions. So the atopic triad, it includes eczema, it includes asthma, and it includes allergies. So that can include food allergies, dust allergies, hay fever, things like that. And I have all of those. Um, I was diagnosed with those very, very young, probably about one or two years old. Um, so I've always lived with um, eczema, asthma and allergies to eggs, fish and nuts. Um, they're all genetic. My dad has exactly the same triad as me. Um, he's the only one in his family, weirdly enough, who has that triad, but he passed it down to me. Um, so I lived with those up until... 14, they were the only things that I dealt with. Um, food allergies are a bit difficult um, and, you know, going out to eat is a bit of a nightmare. Um, it's easier now because there's allergy menus. There wasn't allergy menus maybe even 10 years ago. You would go and you say you've got allergies and they're like, oh, um, we don't know if we can feed you. So that was, you know, really difficult when you're quite young and you want to go out to food with your friends. You just can't. Um, but then around about 14, we'll skip forward, um, I developed um, IBD symptoms. I was going to the bathroom quite a lot. I had these incredible cramps. Um, so my mom took me to the doctor and he said, I think you might have ulcerative colitis, but we'll have to do some tests. Um, I got referred for tests. I was um, admitted to the children's hospital in my area and they did blood tests and they said to my mom, well, you'll be happy to know she doesn't have inflammatory bowel disease because she's got no inflammation markers in her blood. So it was like, okay, so what's, what's going on? I'm, I'm going to the bathroom 10 times a day. I'm bleeding, I'm in pain. I'm having all this time off school. And they were like, you know, she's gone. Which is great at 14, because you know, you're going through puberty, you've got GCSEs, 
and then you've got all of this that's happening and doctors don't know what's going on with you um so i think we went back to the gp and we were like we need something else someone needs to look at her and figure out what on earth is going on so they referred me to birmingham's children's hospital um and within I think about a week of um, being referred there, I was then in a horrific flare-up and they said, right, bring her in. I was admitted to hospital. Um, I was in hospital for about eight days and I had um, a colonoscopy and endoscopy and I was put to sleep for all of them. So I didn't experience any of the pain. I think it's because I was a child. They were like, rather than traumatizing her, seeing the camera go down her throat, we'll just put her to sleep. So that was fine. And I woke up and the nurse came in and she said, you've got ulcerative colitis. I was like, cool, what's that? <laughs> Never heard of it, don't know what it is. Um, and she said, it's, it's in the entirety of your um, large intestine. We're going to give you some steroids and medicine and you can go home. You can live a normal life, you'll be fine. And I was like, okay, cool. Let's, let's get on with normal life then. Um, Normal life doesn't have these conditions. Come at me, GCSEs. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We'll just carry on being a normal 15 year old. Um, and normal life doesn't happen with this condition. Um, you can have peaks and you can have troughs, you can start new medication and it doesn't work. You can be in remission for years and then something can just throw you completely out of kilter. Um, so I was given um, prednisolone in an IV and I was sent home with a whole lot of tablets. And I was also given a uh, mesalazine tablets as well. Um, and I've been on the mesalazine tablets since I was diagnosed. So you're talking maybe 10 years I've been on those. Um, I was tried on azathioprine and that didn't work. I was admitted to a hospital being on azathioprine because it gave me um, acute pancreatitis at 19. So I spent my 19th birthday in hospital, which was so sad. <laughs> I remember waking up on my 19th birthday and one of the nurses had got me some chocolate because he was like, this is really sad. You're on your own. No one can come and see you, but I'm going to give you this because I'm kind. So that was really lovely. Um, and then I was put on, after they'd taken me off adocyacrine, I was just on um, mesalazine tablets and then mesalazine enemas. No one wants to be on an enema at 19. That's not a nice medication to take at any age, but when you're still a teenager and you're friends are asking you what medicine you're on, you don't want to tell them that you're taking an enema because it's just embarrassing. But I took enemas for about six years. I was taking them every night, every other night, and it kept me in some kind of remission for about six years. Um, and then about maybe a year, the 18 months ago, had a really, really bad flare up. And I think it was because my mental health was in such a bad place. I just felt really, really unsure of where my life was going. Um, went back to the hospital, they did some tests and I was put on adalimumab biologic. So I've been on um, biologic medication for just over a year now. And I'm in a kind of remission with that. Um, but if anyone has seen my um, my Instagram, I know that I'm having a bit of issues with my skin at the moment. I say a bit of issues, I'm having a lot of issues with my skin. <laughs> um, I know, it's ridiculous. So I've had allergic reactions to um, two different types of antibiotics in the last six weeks. Um, I'm waiting to be, um, to have an appointment with a dermatologist this coming week so we can kind of get some kind of answers as to what's going on with my skin because it's is it eczema is it not eczema I would like to not be dealing with eczema at 25 you know um but it is a skin condition that I've got for life the same as my ulcerative colitis I've also got that for life um and I kind of made my page because um my NHS therapy was coming to an end um I had therapy for around about three years on and off. I say on and off because the time between having appointments is so scarce. You could barely even really call it therapy. I'd have therapy maybe four times a year because I wouldn't see her for so long. So it was like, you'd have a massive catch up and then like five, 10 minutes of therapy. So it wasn't really, it wasn't really therapy. Um, but that was kind of coming to an end. I didn't feel like it was helping me anymore, but I knew that my mental health still wasn't great. 
Um, and I'd known that there was Instagram accounts for people who had chronic illness, but I'd never thought of making my own because I'd never seen anyone talk about the different conditions that I had. It was always an account for um, um, IBD or it was an account for eczema. There was never kind of a, a collation of the two. And all of the forums that I'd kind of joined were just middle-aged people or it was parents talking about their babies. And I was like, I don't fit into any of these categories. I have no children and I'm not middle-aged. <laughs> so I thought I can try and make my own and just kind of fill that gap because there's surely got to be other people who have the same kind of conditions as me in the same kind of, um, well, just in the same kind of vein. I'd never met anybody who had IBD, who also had food allergies and had asthma. But since making this account this year, I've met quite a few people who have that. So it's really validating just to know that I'm not the only person going through stuff like this. Because in my bubble, I'm the only one dealing with all of these different conditions. People have um, asthma around me or they have eczema or they have IBS around me, but they don't have the collation of all of them. Um, so, yeah, I'm quite new. I'm still kind of finding my feet with um, just sharing things online because it's still very new to me. Um, but I'm just really grateful that you wanted me to come and speak on here because I'm so new. I'm not very established. And I was like, what do I talk about? But <laughs> what do I do here? <laughs> what do I do? So that's kind of my story. Um, just dealing with lots of different things at the moment. I think when my skin and things can kind of get sorted out, then I can kind of talk about those kind of issues a bit more as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's me. That's amazing. And I think looking at, and I'll put everyone's Instagram handles like towards the end of the chat in the chat box, so everyone can go and follow everyone, but you would never know that your account is so new because I guess, and I think with, with anyone who puts this kind of stuff out there on the internet, it requires a lot of bravery to get started and to be so honest and so vulnerable and be like, here's all the bad things. Like, yeah, here's this horrible works. shit. <laughs> and your, your account is so it's so honest and it's so open and I think it's very um it's like a really raw look at some of the things that you suffer with like at the moment with your skin and you know the things that you talk about but like you said finding all these different people since you've put your voice out there must be so nice in a weird way isn't it it's never nice to know that other people are like going through the same stuff as you but at the same time how comforting that you know there's probably so many other people who are thinking exactly yeah. the same thing as you, you like there's no so one alone. here like, like me someone else is dealing with this someone else is dealing with skin issues I am too it's like I'm not just on my own in it so it is very validating absolutely well your page is amazing and thank you for thank you. like sharing your story and, and being so honest always I think it's um yeah it's I find it very refreshing when people are like I've got this I've got this this is shit but also just like living a good life and just having to get on with it because I guess that's what we all have to do despite yeah like your allergies and your triad of stuff and your skin condition and your colitis which I've got a question about that and your diagnosis for the end as well okay. but just it's very um it's really inspiring I think and on Sunday morning in the shit weather let's all come together let's share the team thank you Abia. that was um that was really amazing and really honest thank you so much and last but not least to the table we have James James where you at yeah Oh, literally you disappeared from my screens I was like I hope you still, he's still on the call like no I don't want to talk anymore sorry guys can't follow that lead see you later <laughs> yeah and I'm out go for it James take the floor so I'm James I am 29 years old and I'm from Birmingham and um, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis um when I was 21 there was no like warning signs um, I was on holiday with my family, um, celebrating my granddad's birthday. So there was like a good like 17 of us and we were in Tenerife. The weather was really nice. I spent most of my holiday in the room or stuck on the toilet. Um, and I wasn't really sure what was happening or what was going on. It was just, and I was a little bit in denial because I was like, what is this? Hopefully it's just like gonna go away. Um, and it obviously didn't. So when I got home, um, I did have to see a GP because I was like, I'm just continually bleeding. Like at the start, it was quite bad as well. So um, 
and I got that age old thing when you go and see the GP where um you like IBD wasn't mentioned straight away it's always IBS and I am not playing down anybody that suffers with IBS as well as inflammatory bowel disease but it definitely wasn't IBS like it was a lot more um, and I'm, I'm not that academic but I knew the difference between inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome um, and I was just sort of like I was in denial at the start because I knew that like it was there was something wrong I just didn't want to admit it and I would like I did for a while shut myself off because I thought I don't really want to do anything and especially when it was bad I just like I stopped doing things I mean I was 21 like at the time where you should be going out and like enjoying yourself like partying with your friends and I'm there like sat on the toilet absolutely like shit in blood and, and I was like what is like is this gonna be for the rest of my life now so um when I was referred um I am um, I just remember asking like about my consultant like about the diagnosis and he told me it was ulcerative colitis and I think one of the first questions was like can you die because when you, when you, um, when you've like not had, like I knew of Crohn's, but I never had ulcerative colitis, which is obviously so common, and we all know that, like Crohn's tends to, at least be the more commonly mentioned one, um, and I just remember thinking, well, like what's going to happen in my life now? Because when you've not heard of something and they're like, but there's no cure for it, you're sort of like, well does that mean that you could eventually die um, and I always remember asking that and I also remember that like when when I found out about it I was sort of like and this is no disrespect to any consultant or Crohn's Colitis UK charity but the consultant literally handed me a fact sheet about ulcerative colitis from Crohn's and Colitis UK and I'm like really what is going on um like how he's just supposed to read about it like I don't know it was just that that always especially when you're like face to face with them it's like we're literally sat here opposite each other can't yeah. you at least guide me through yeah, like, like you horrible me, thing. You're specialist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's one it's one of those things as well isn't it you literally think like someone's changed your life within like what a 15 minute appointment and something that's going to dictate the rest of your life and it's just sort of like well you've got to deal with it now and I've always struggled and I think when I've learned a lot more and like like I'm totally at peace now with the fact I have ulcerative colitis and I'm very openly talking about it and I think mentally more than physically it really affected me to start off with because I was it like it came out of nowhere so and when it when something changes your life that quickly and you have to adapt to it you just I always feel like mentally at the start of a diagnosis process there's not enough support because you're literally sent away with like steroids and mesalazine um and left to sort of fend for yourself for a little while um I was on steroid, I was steroid dependent for a good two to three years. And I would, as soon as I'd um, come off the steroids, like as I'd get to like the last week, I'd just be like, I, I, I was continually flaring. So it'd like keep it at bay for a little bit and then it'd just con continually go back. So it was like constantly like, oh, well, you come, you're coming off them, you'll, you'll have a week and then you'll start them again. And then I would, similar to Afia, I I was like I was trying enemas which I absolutely hated getting on with I don't know how anybody else feels about them but it was like I could never hold for 10 minutes without feeling like I needed to go to the toilet when it, when you can't control your bowel movements anyway trying to like exactly they're hold. just the most confusing medication it's like well I need this medication because I can't because I can't stop going to the bathroom but now I need to stop going to the bathroom 
to but make the medication it makes you feel like you want to go to the bathroom yeah. as well so it's just sort of like it honestly I, I hated them and I would always try them but it, it would never help um and I was on mistazoline for quite a while until I had um I had a colonoscopy and they um basically just said that that wasn't working either um and I feel like those were like really maintenance as well like steroids and mesazoline are really maintenance ones that like if you're not really flaring they're like great um I've tried a few different medications um I um I tried azathioprine, similar story to Afia. Um, it actually made me really unwell to the point that I haven't really been hospitalised that much from a um, IBD, but it actually made me um, that unwell that I had to go into hospital. Um, I was only on it for a period of about six weeks and um, I was an inpatient for a week because it just started to shut my body down. Um, and there was no real it, it's now a medication that I'm allergic to because of what it was doing to my body and um, so that didn't work which is always fun um and then after that it was decided that I'd then go on to um Humira which worked for a good 18 months and I was like yes so good like I'm feeling great however um my eating habits were never fantastic anyway and they still aren't but I almost found that with um, Humira, I, I just put on so much weight as well. I think it was maybe because I was taking advantage of the fact that um, I was feeling okay. So I was like literally eating as well. And then I was like, but the weight was like going on like quite fast. So I was arguing my, with my consultant saying, I am eating what I would usually eat. But for some reason I'm putting on like a good stone like in a very short amount of time and he was just telling me it was my eating habits so I was getting frustrated I was like very annoyed he was like you're clearly like not eating properly I was like I'm eating the same as I was when you diagnosed me like how does this help um that then started to wear off um like I said it like it worked well for a good 18 months and then um the next sort of thing was um another medication which I sort of knew was going to happen anyway because I was I'd just come off these medications or I'd start to flare and it's just you know what it's like it's a continual like you're working your way through the medication table um so I'm currently on um vedalizumab which is known as Envito or all of those other fun names that no one can pronounce um and I've been on that actually it came up on my Facebook memories like three years this week and it is the medication that's helped me for the longest kept me without mostly no symptoms for the longest the last time I had a colonoscopy last year I wasn't in remission there was still patches of inflammation but it was the best my bowel had looked since I've been diagnosed nine years ago so my ulcerative colitis is in quite a good place but I've, I have noticed recently especially with coronavirus that if I get anxious or stressed then like it's it must um I can become symptomatic very quickly um so it's, for me it's about managing my um my mental health and my stress and I guess the only other thing to say because we'll stop talking now is um on my Instagram I do talk about um living with ulcerative colitis how it affects my mental health and my body image um from my body changing to being like a men's 32 waist trousers to then having to go up like ridiculous amount of sizes because my body has changed and it's constantly adapting um and I haven't had any surgery so I'm like I'm advocating talking about body image before surgery as well because I think that's really important because um sometimes in the community we do focus a lot on um people who have had surgery and it's really important for us to be able to see the, the start of it as well so yeah that's me yeah, love that. And James, you and I had a chat not that long ago, didn't we, about like pre-surgery and post-surgery bodies and and not even pre-surgery, but just those who haven't and those who have. Because I think sometimes in the IBD community, like what we were saying when we chatted, sometimes people who haven't gone through surgery get a bit blanket overlooked in some cases because it's not as bad as those who've had surgery. There's like this weird misconception that if you've had surgery, 
your symptoms must be worse, you must be worse suffering. And I think that overlooks and sometimes invalidates a lot of people who, you know, like like most of us that here probably have really, really horrible symptoms and go through hell sometimes, you know, managing them as best we can. But for, for whatever reason, in terms of, I don't know, an aesthetic level, it gets overlooked. It's like, oh, but yours isn't that bad. You're fine. And I think there's some really important conversations, especially that you have, James, on your Instagram about like, this is my body, this is what I'm dealing with, and this is how I'm feeling. And I think it's actually, personally, I find it really important to raise those conversations as well and just to kind of normalize all aspects of IBD, like whether it's Crohn's, whether it's crisis, had surgery, not had surgery, just to make everyone feel, you know, validated, I suppose. There's nothing worse, I think we've all experienced it, than feeling like your illness is not recognized or not believed or not validated or not you know important enough so yeah that's amazing thank you james for sharing now i've written some questions but some other people have started to write some too in the comment section so we'll do theirs first because they're probably better than mine uh bav has said and this is a question to everybody how do you guys deal with people not understanding ibd so employers friends family and that is to each of you so whoever wants to kick off first with how you deal with people not understanding Ooh, go on ricky <laughs> okay i um, see you leveling up <laughs> <laughs> no it's just it was interesting for me because soon after my diagnosis i told one of my best friends at the time and he was like ill and i was like i have just been going through hell right now my body's been going through this this has been mentally challenging. And then like James said, you're literally just handed a pamphlet and then medications like, okay, off you go. It's like, what the hell? My wife, my life has just been turned upside down. And that is the first thing that comes out of your mouth. It's ill. And the thing is, it's like some people don't get it and some people don't understand. And there's often some people aren't educated and I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying it's okay at all. We're not friends anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> Bye -bye. <laughs> <laughs> right. I had to leave that over there but at the same time I do understand sometimes when people don't get things they don't know how to respond um so that was hard for me but I think since then with friends it's like I've kind of just had to fully evaluate how good of a friend is this person to me and would it benefit the relationship if they know about this condition you know and I think as well I hadn't come to terms with it I was in denial about my um, diagnosis for like a couple years I'll be honest I was like no <laughs> like so every time I, I talked about it I started crying and it's like I'm a lot more at peace with it now and I'm a lot more open about it so it's like talking about it so I know now that people's reactions don't define me you know their opinions don't define me I am who I am and my condition doesn't define me either. So if you feel some type of way about it, then you can stay over there basically <laughs> is how I see it. But um, yeah, so my friends now, everybody's very supportive and very understanding of it. Um, as it comes to um, like employers and stuff for a while, I didn't, I wasn't really open about it because I just didn't want to feel like, I think part of me had this thought in my head that, oh, they'll see me as less than or less capable of doing my job or if I need special treatment or if I need days off I didn't want to feel like that would affect my choices and um, chances of employment so for, for the most part I didn't actually say anything and if I had doctor's appointments I'll try and make it outside of work times if possible but you know how it works it's always at like slap bang in the middle of the day and it's like I can't go to work because the time I get there I have to leave to the appointment and it's ugh, annoying but um, it got to the point where I was like okay when I did start to have like really bad flare-ups it was affecting my work and it was affecting my mental capacity during the day. And I was like, okay, I just have to be a bit more open because now my boss is on my case and thinking I'm just being lazy and underperforming when there's just so much more going on. So I literally just had to get to the point where um, even sometimes like I had to basically just pull my employer aside and be like, okay, I need to talk to you about what's going on with me. This is how it affects me. This is how it may affect my ability to do my job. Um, in most cases, it won't but I can give you a heads up if I'm feeling this type of way. And our relationship got so much better after that. Cause I, okay, I understand now this makes so much more sense. And they were a lot less harsh on me. Cause they're like, okay, I know you're not underperforming now. I just know you just have other things going on. That's fine. Just let me know if you are feeling bad and I'll take it from there. But people can't understand what they don't know. And that's definitely something that I've learned. So yeah, sorry, <laughs> that's my answer for that. No. 
so true so true Afia what about you what's your experience been um my experience was very strange when I was in school because I was a teenager as well so kids didn't really understand it was like why are you lost sick so much I was like I've just got sickness and diarrhea I don't want to tell I don't want to tell them what was going on people understood what sickness and diarrhea was so I just went with that um but I know that when I got diagnosed someone said um that they were really jealous because I had a skinny disease what? yeah <coughs> but they basically said they were really jealous because whenever I would go off sick I would come back and I would have lost loads of weight so they said well, what you can do is when you want to lose weight make yourself have a flare-up and then you can get into your clothes <gasps> again and I was like that is the most ridiculous thing I think I've ever heard to date about my condition um wow so yeah we don't talk anymore either <laughs> <laughs> in terms of um family um, I really struggled with telling my family about my condition. I usually had my mum and dad just tell my aunts and uncles about what was going on because I didn't want to talk about it. Um, not so much that I was in, maybe I was in denial, I don't know, but I just didn't want to talk about it. I was embarrassed about it, given what the condition was about. I didn't want to tell my family about my bowel movements and whether I was bleeding or not. It's like, it's not, this is not family conversation, but now it kind of is. They asked me about how my health is and I'm like, cool, I'll tell you everything since you asked. And since I've yeah. told them, they now understand more. I think the more open that you are, the better. But that has taken me quite a long time to get to a place where I'm comfortable talking about that. It's probably only been in the last two years and I've had the condition for about 11. So that can kind wow. of show you how long it can kind of come to terms with the fact that you do have this condition for life. It's not IBS, even though you think it is, because it affects the same place, you know. Um, and kind of similar to Ricky with employers, it was um, the more open that I was, the better. Um, my office is really cold. And I think, I don't know whether this is kind of a universal thing or if it's just me, but I really struggled with the cold with having an autoimmune disease. Um, yeah. So I was going into the office in June and July in thick jumpers and scarves. And it was kind of a running joke in the office, like, oh, Ophelia's cold again. And I was like, no, I'm freezing. I need the job. So I got a referral through my manager through, for occupational health because I was like, this is silly. I can't focus. Yeah. I'm tired. I'm irritable. I'm having hot water bottles in August. Like I need, to, I need to be able to do my job properly so you can get the best out of me and I can, you know, contribute better. So through that referral, I then got um, a heater. So I have a heater at my desk now so I can do my job properly. But that's only because I then had that conversation with my managers that they were able to support me. So I think once you can kind of come to a place where you are comfortable talking about it, because you've got to do it on your terms, no one can force you to have that conversation. Um, but the more open that I've been, I think the easier that it, it has been. Yeah, amazing. Sure. So true. I'm so glad you got that heater. Oh my God, there is nothing worse than it's being- It's been life changing, honestly. It's brilliant. I'm, People try and steal it now because I'm not in the office as much for the work from home. And I'm like, it's got my name on it. So if you take it, that's fine. I'm still going to find it. <laughs> I love that it's got your name on it too. Like, that yeah, is actually the back, my heater. There's, there's a scene in the office. I'm like, you're not taking it. It's mine. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Give me my goddamn heater back. Oh, you need that. <laughs> Oh my god, I love that. What about you, James? Have you um have you had any experiences with people not understanding, whether it's employers, friends, family, strangers? I don't know. I feel like maybe the um like my family have always been really good. Um in terms of my um my mom, it doesn't happen anymore. I'm 29 years old now. But um at the start, especially when I was really unwell, would um, attend my appointments with me because obviously she knew like how like what I was going through and how unwell I was. And then it was almost like having that back up there. So like, I'm really thankful that I was able to like have that and for like to have a room in my corner really and someone understand. Um, with my extended family, it's sort of, well, I never sort of really had to have the conversation because they'd event that they'd saw me getting worse, so they knew something was wrong. So when it was eventually, oh, James has got this, it was just it's getting used to it really. And I think it's a like it it's almost like you can have that one hand where you're like, why don't why doesn't someone understand what I'm going through? But also like 
they don't have the education of what you're going through either. So you have to give them a little bit of leeway and it is hard, but I think like the girls have said, unless you have like an honest conversation with somebody and they're able to like sort of sit down and like just listen to you and hear you out and you allow them to ask you questions, then having that conversation and that back and forth will educate those people, whether it's friends, family. And um, I suppose when I was um, when I was diagnosed at 21, it cut off a lot of my social life because I was scared to go outside, like scared that I was going to have an accident. And um, so I did sort of cut myself off a little bit. So it took a while for me to sort of get back into socialising and be comfortable to be able to be around people and talk about it. But if you know me, you'll know that it's all I talk about now. So if it's not on my Instagram, it's probably on the social media. So like people can't get away from it. So um, if they're not educated, they're going to be educated, unfortunately. Um, because I didn't know what it was. So if I can say to somebody, this is what I have and this is how it affects me. And there's many people out there that it also affects. If it's making that small little bit of difference and educating somebody, then I'm just going to talk about it like it's taboo isn't it so we may as well just continue to talk about it and I think maybe from an employer point of view um I was diagnosed when I'd just been promoted and um, I worked in a um a retail business um for around 12 years I left earlier this year but um I I'd just been promoted to a management position and I'd moved to a different store to the one I was at and I became really unwell and the manager at the time who I knew from obviously like just working within the business was convinced that I hated being at that particular store because it was quieter but it was just all of these things and I was really unwell and I kept asking to go to the toilet all the time and she was like you just hate it you just hate it and I was like I don't I just can't stop shitting myself <laughs> I was like oh my god honestly it was horrendous and like my probation got extended because like I hadn't I hadn't really had a diagnosis then either. This was literally just before I went on holiday. Um, so like my probation for that job um, got extended just because um, I wasn't well and I wasn't able to show, <laughs> show how committed I was because I was so sidetracked with what was going on. But after that, especially in the sort of like past couple of years, like my employer has been really great in the fact that um, when I have my infusions um, or when I had them when I was with them I would have the day of the infusion off and then the day after um because I not so much anymore it's been like three years now but I found that I was so tired afterwards that it would affect my ability to then be at work the day after um but on the flip side I'm going to wrap it up in a second because I know I've spoken out just about this but I think it's really important um I am now in a job where um, I would have not been in it if I hadn't have ever spoken about my IBD. And um, part of like me in my interview for this job, I, I just spoke about my advocacy and what I do. So like for anybody that doesn't know, I, um, I was really passionate about fundraising and charity. Um, and I now work for um, a charity supporting people who do fundraise, um, which is something that I'd always been really passionate about. So had I not have spoken about my OBD and had those honest conversations, I would not be in this job. So there is always a, like a cloud. So That's amazing. Actually, that is kind of give me an inspiration for what we can wrap up on. I was, I've actually got a whole list of questions, but... We've only got five minutes and I don't want to steal any more time of anybody's Sunday. So based on what James has just kind of hinted at, I would be really interested in everyone sharing a little piece of wisdom or advice or something that they've had that's, you know, like a positive outcome from living with Crohn's, colitis, autoimmune diseases, the community, like whatever it is, what is like one positive thing that you think that you can take away from it that you can share with other people? We'll start with who I'm gonna pick on a beer. Um, because I'm quite new, even though I've lived with this condition for so long, I think that the better the more that you can talk about it, the better. I've definitely noticed in the last two years since I've um 
spoken about all of my different illnesses, spoken to waiters in, in restaurants about having um, food allergies, about um, talking to my family about when I feel unwell and being honest about what is actually going on. It's not I'm just poorly, it's now we're going to the bathroom six times a day. Being more honest about it can definitely just improve your mental health so much. I think the, the long, I don't know where is that possible. <laughs> The amount of time that I spent not talking about it compared to the small amount of time that I have, I can definitely see just how my mental health has improved. So I think the more that you can talk about it, yeah, the better. Does that make Amazing. <laughs> of course it does. Makes perfect sense. Ricky, what about you? Um, I think knowing that we are not given more that we, than we can handle and we have the power to overcome anything that we go through has been a definite thing that has kind of kept me going and kept helped me with my mindset going through because often you can feel helpless and you can feel like a bit of a victim but I just kept reminding myself I have the power to overcome and grow through what I'm going through so I'm going to use that power and use it as an opportunity to grow and adapt and I feel like as a person I've really really like I used to be painfully shy <laughs> like I've definitely grown and come out of my shell a lot just through going through this and having these conversations and putting myself out there as well and that type of um characteristic development can trickle through to all areas in your life not just as it pertains to health or anything so that would be my takeaway 100 percent. i love that also you would never know that you used to be painfully shy <laughs> at all literally <laughs> at all i love it like yeah i was shy now just doing like sunday morning presentations no problem. right <laughs> <laughs> i love that and what about you james even though you've already given a little whisper of your positivity what's your what's your wrapping statement um i always think and it's always good to be honest about it a lot of my acceptance from um being able to talk about living with ulcerative colitis is because i've continued to constantly talk about it um and i know it's really hard for people so i completely understand that it takes a while to be able to be confident but talking about it has changed my life like it's brought really shit things into my life but it's absolutely <laughs> changed my life as well so just you know when you feel like you're able to reach out even if it's to someone in the community even if it's to like some random person that you just want to have a conversation with it's so important to talk about it because if you don't it's just going to eat away at you and a lot of the like I said a lot of the acceptance is because um you talk about it and it becomes it's quite cathartic to talk about now like when I talk about it I'm like off, off my chest like don't need to talk about that anymore but like it will help other people as well even if you don't think it will like I'm sure like all of the ladies will agree that like we never all start talking about it to think oh like um people might listen like you're just talking about it to to get it off your chest so I don't know like just keep on talking and it will be hard but you will literally in 10 years time thank yourself for being so open and honest because it could change your life oh my gosh I love that could we have finished on a more like quote worthy sentence I absolutely love that and it's so true I think you're right I think it's not only helpful for others to understand like what we're going through, but it's helpful to understand for ourselves. And it's so self-soothing and so cathartic to, to just go through that process of, even if it's not online, you know, talking about it, writing about it, thinking about it so that you do come to terms with what you're dealing with on a daily basis and it becomes more normal for other people, which is so, so important. But it's also important for ourselves because like you said, and I think we've all kind of shared experiences about our hospital appointments and consultants, no one else is really there for you to hold your hand and to take you through that process. So you have to really do a lot of that learning and that growing totally on your own and, you know, be self-motivated to do that. And I think it's easier said than done. It's very, very easy to shut yourself off, not talk about it, be very much in denial, feel really negative about it. But I think the process of going on that journey, you know, my IBD and me, that could be a book, I think actually it is a book. Anyway, uh, you know, that will only hopefully help yourselves and help other people as well. So thank you guys so, so much for uh, joining, for speaking. Thank you everyone for giving up an hour on your Sunday morning. 
I mean, the weather's not great, so I don't really know what else you'd be doing anyway. But I really, really appreciate all of your time. And Ricky, Afia and James, you've been chef's kiss, creme de la creme. So thank you so much for giving up your time and for speaking. It's been gorgeous. Uh, your Instagrams are all on the side there, but they are all tagged in my story. So if anyone wants to go follow you, chat to you, talk further, I'm sure your inboxes will be open. Apologies if I've now just given you work to do. But yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you all have a gorgeous rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you for the Thank you. Me. No worries. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.